Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is on stewardship, motives of the heart. And we're getting down near the end of that series. This is lesson number 12 entitled, The Habits of a Steward. The Habits of a Steward. Well, we'll see what those are supposed to be uh, in this lesson. We're going, to ask, we're going to begin by asking you to bow your head with us as we ask the Lord's guidance in our study. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to be considered your sons, your stewards, your children, uh, whatever it is that you have in mind for us, heirs, joint heirs with you. So as we consider how we might be preparing ourselves for those roles, even while we're still on this earth, help us to develop the habits of true stewards, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the real point of this lesson is to discuss habits. What's the purpose of habits? Now, we, we, you've probably heard, we've probably heard lots of things about good things and especially bad things about habits. Um, people developing bad habits. Habits are good because you don't have to think about them. Yeah. And you can think about something else when you're doing, doing the things you're not thinking about. Okay, so long as you develop the good habits. That's bad like habits a, are, are bad for the same reason. It's like a soccer player, or yeah, he would, you know, handles the ball automatically, doesn't have to think about where the ball, just how to kick it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, while he thinks about the game. So in that case, habit yeah. would be good. Skillful habits are very, very, very useful. And we all, we, we would never be able to get through a day if we had to stop and think carefully through each new thing we did. I mean, you know, it would just, I mean, look at some, and look at some examples from the Bible. Daniel had a habit of going home at lunchtime opening his window wide, praying toward Jerusalem. Was that a good habit? Mm -hmm. Got him into trouble, didn't it? But then it got rid of his enemies. I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, Jesus attended the synagogue every Sabbath. Was that a good thing? Luke 4, 16. Paul always attended synagogues when he could. Acts 17, 1 and 2. Additionally, Paul recognized that associating with people who have bad habits can cause a lot of problems, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. So how do we cultivate good habits to replace bad ones? Kerry? We shall be individually for time and eternity what our habits make us. The lives of those who form right habits and are faithful in the performance of every duty will be as shining lights shedding bright beams upon the pathway of others. And that's from Testimonies from the Church, Volume 4. Okay. <coughs> Page 452 there, huh? So what is a habit? It is a neural pathway that is the quickest way to do, to get to the behavior a person wants to do. It is an ingrained decision. One does not have to stop and think about it. She or he just does it by nature. Habits can be good or bad, so this week we will discuss what habits should be developed by a faithful Christian steward. We all need habits. Uh, what would happen if we had to carefully think through everything we do when we get up in the morning? Do I, why do I wear stocks? Do I need to wear shoes? How do I brush my teeth? Um, anyway, you can see it would get very complicated. Which shoe goes on which foot? I mean, if you had to think all those things through every morning, you'd be tired before you got to work. I thought when I was reading this this morning about obsessive compulsives. Yeah. <laughs> Seen yeah. some really good ones of that, and what a distress it is for them. Yeah. So habits are important in minimizing the amount of nervous energy that must be expended to get through our day, so we can save what nervous energy we have for doing what's really important. So what habits are good for Christians? Fred? A quote, uh, two quotes from Ellen White. First one from Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, 
page 15. Every morning, dedicate yourself, soul, body, and spirit to God. Establish habits of devotion and trust more and more in your Savior. The second one is from Desire of Ages, page uh, 83, paragraph 4. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humili humiliation, humiliation I'm sorry, at the foot of the cross. Wow. What would our lives be like if we all did that every day? It'd be a different world, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. It would be a state of at one mm -hmm. with the Creator. Exactly. Surely habits like these will point us in the direction of the road to heaven. There are many verses in the Bible suggesting that seeking God first should be the basic motive of Christians. Look at some examples that are very familiar. Exodus 20, verse 3. Worship no other God but me. No God other but me. Matthew 6, 33. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Is that, is that still a valid thing to do? Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. So how do we put God first in our lives? Is that a practical thing to do in 2018? I mean, how much... Thoughts, thoughts to Him at, uh, as soon as we wake up. Mm -hmm. Jesus, remember, said on one occasion, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. So how do we how do we develop that love for God? Would it be a better way to say that this is the first and great prescription? Prescription, because well, God cannot command love. Yeah. Uh, but it's a prescription. If you want to know how to live, follow this example, and, and then you get to John seventeen three. Eternal life is to know the Father, mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ, who the Father had sent. Well, there's lots of reasons why we should respect God. Look at Acts 17, 28. As someone has said, in Him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are His children. So God created us. He gives us the power to do what we do every day. Uh, and there's other verses. If we recognize that our, even our physical existence is a gift of God, surely we should love Him first and make Him top priority in our lives. And he, commit, he commands us to love our fellow human beings as well. We need to make a good use of every opportunity that comes to us. And we need to do it with all our energy as if we were working for God himself. Well, there's considerable evidence in Scripture as well as supporting evidence from Ellen White to suggest that Jesus spent a lot of his time every night or sometimes early in the morning communicating with his father. No doubt they planned his activities for the upcoming day. So would it be possible for us to actually plan our next day's activities in consultation with God? Could that happen in our, our time? What do you think? It should never be done without God. Mm -hmm. And you, you, your plans are based upon the principles that you've learned over time. I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh, you know, all of a sudden... All, you know, it's, it's a learning process. How would you do that? Exactly how do you plan? Analyze if way. your plans are intended or motivated by love as opposed to self-centeredness, which we talked about a little earlier today. Well, that's kind of general. It's but, general. But if you, if you have your plan, if you have your day laid out before you, um, how do you get it? How do you plan? 
to make that happen with God. Well, obviously, the Bible suggests we should start with God, with prayer, with thinking about Him, taking some time to say, God, help me today to do your will, to find the means and the opportunities to, to use for the benefit of your cause, that kind of stuff. Well, that's an objective, but how do you plan? Well, if, you're, if you have a job like mine, <laughs> that's a little difficult. I mean, you never know what's coming next. Every new patient that I see as a doctor has a different kind of a problem, and I have no way of knowing in advance what it's going to be. Well, I guess, I guess the best you can do is just make sure he's with you. Yeah. Because. Well, Luke 2, 49 has a very interesting verse. That's talking about Jesus when he was very young. He answered them, his parents, Why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, that's a different, little different translation than the, the King James. Uh, Jesus said, when confronted by his mother, who had found him in the temple, I must be about my father's business, in the King James Version. A more idiom, idiomatic translation of that verse, as seen in the Good News Bible, says, he answered them, which I read to you, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand his, his answer. Now, um, why do I say that's a more idiomatic understanding or translation? Most of the modern translations will have that. In languages around the Middle East, uh, there's a way of expressing, uh, this was true even in Swahili, where I was in East Africa. Uh, there's a word that can be used in that situation, and just says, at yours. And, and that means, uh, that's the closest I can come to in English, but it means at your house or at your place. Um, and Jesus has said, didn't you know you would be, I would be at my father's? And the people back in the King James day, they didn't know what that, so they assumed that he must be talking about doing his father's business. But he was really saying, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? Well. But that, you could almost, I've, I've pondered this over quite a bit over the years, it almost seems insolent. But I don't think it was, but no. what was the what was the feeling of parents in those days? Because yeah. he still was only 12, he was yeah. a child. But uh, Ellen White discusses that, as you know, in Desire of Ages. And she said that during that week, or, or however long they spent there, he for the first time really recognized his relationship to his father. And he's saying, I mean, they knew that Joseph wasn't his father. There was no question in their mind that Joseph wasn't the father. Right. So he was just saying, you know, it's time for you to start recognizing that I have another father that I have responsibility to. I think that's what he was really trying to say. And if we remember Isaiah 50, the father was the one who really taught him everything he knew. Yeah. And that's why he could really tell, he could really tell those um, Pharisees that they had a lot to learn. Yeah. Well, Luke 6, verse 12 is a very interesting comment. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night praying to God. And what happened the next morning, do you remember? No, the disciples. The next morning was a time that he, he chose his disciples. So do you think, his, he, you think he was very sleepy and could hardly keep his eyes open when he did that? It, Ellen White implies that he could, he could pray all night and he'd come out refreshed. How did he do that? I, I wish I understood what exactly what was going on there. Now, I, I know if you have a really good friend, I know I, this, this has happened to a number of people, I know, it's happened to me a few times, that you haven't seen for a while, you, sit, you get with them and you can talk and manage, how, where did the time go, you know? So I have to assume that Jesus, when he was talking with his father, had some, something like that. So have, have we made God first in our lives? Look at this passage from Luke 12. Be ready for whatever comes, dress for action and with your lamps lit, like servants who are waiting for their master to come back from a wedding feast. When he comes and knocks, they will open the door for him at once. 
How happy are those servants whose master uh, finds them awake and ready, uh, even if he should come at midnight or even later. And you know, you can be sure that if the owner of a house knew not uh, knew the time when the thief would come, he would not let the thief break into his house. And you too must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you are not expecting him. Is, is that true? Uh, Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, Paul says, don't don't be surprised. Um, you, you're not like people who are completely don't know what's going on. We've warned you. You're supposed to be ready. So how do we put those two together? Well, maybe one is speaking of the time, the general time, mm -hmm. versus the exact time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure. And of course. It's always wise. Basically, Jesus is saying, be prepared all the time. He could also be saying the truth will come to you when you don't expect it. Yeah. At the end of time, when we know the truth should yeah. set us free. Well, if we are developing right habits by putting God first in our lives, we must do so intentionally, repeatedly, and for it to become a habit. Are we truly and eagerly awaiting God's return, the Savior's return, Jesus' return? Now, there are people who think that uh, if you go to church once a week and you spend an hour or two there, and maybe once in a while you're talking with people, you mention Scripture, and you might open your Bible once a, a week, is that adequate preparation? Not really. It's not going to cut it. Sabbath is a day when we do it with other people. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time we do it by ourselves or with our family in communion with God. Mm -hmm. Very good point. We need to intentionally have a regular plan to search the scriptures, find the lessons which are there for us. Eternity depends on our forming the right habits. Well, in this sinful world, we must always recognize that death is a possibility. I mean... When we go home tonight, sure, there's this, the odds are against anything happening to us, but the roads have been slick recently because of the rains. <coughs> we never know that if we're going to be alive in the, tomorrow morning. So we should be always prepared. If we claim to be Adventists, which means that we are looking forward to the second coming, shouldn't we demonstrate that by our behavior? Well, probably the most precious, precious gift that God has given us. We're talking about stewardship now. The most precious gift, precious gift that God has given us is time. You can't stop it. We can't make it move backwards. We can't move it, make it move forwards. It just keeps going at a steady rate. Are we using time effectively and preparing ourselves and others for the second coming? James tells us how long, uh, how, how lengthy our lives are in, in the light of eternity. James 4.14, you don't even know what your life tomorrow will be like. Will be. You're like a puff of smoke which appears for a moment and then disappears. He also said earlier in that in his book, you're like a, a, a flower of the field that shows up in the morning and fades by night. Psalm 90 says, Verses 10 and following, 70 years is all we have, 80 years if we are strong. Yet all they bring us is trouble and sorrow. Life, life is, full, is soon over and we are gone. Who has felt the full power of your anger? Who knows what fear your fury can bring? Teach us how short our life is so that we may become wise. Are we wise in that sense? Well, God has the ability to look into our future. For Thank goodness nobody else does. Uh, I wouldn't trust anybody else with that ability. With someone so precious, with something so precious as time, we certainly must do our best to use it profit profitably. What does God's word tell us about the use of time? So, another valuable asset which we have available to us is money, of course. We've talked a lot about that this quarter. We have the opportunity to get money back if we, if we lose it somehow. But uh, we don't, our time, we don't, we can't get back. 
Dennis, I think you have some words on that. Yes, this is from uh, Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons 342. Uh, our time belongs to God. Every moment is His, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to His glory. If no talent He has given us, He will, of no talent He has given us, will He require a more strict account than of our time. The value of our time is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious, and it is thus that we should regard it. Life is too short to be trifled away. We have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity. We have no time to waste, no time to devote to selfish pleasure, no time for the indulgence of sin. It is now that we are to form characters for the future immortal life. It is now that we are to prepare for the searching judgment. Well, that's pretty, pretty, so pretty stressful. Pretty sobering, sobering words, right? I think it's pretty stressful. I see. Do you need a little stress? Mm, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> stressful to me. Well, even in his day, Paul declared that the, that his, the, day, the days were evil. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. What do you think Paul would say about our world today? We are surrounded by every kind of an attraction you can possibly imagine to get our mind call our attention this way, that way, this way, that way, that way, behind us, around, by vision and by hearing. Well, how do, we, how do we sort out what's important, what's not? And how do we avoid wasting, wasting our time? When Adam and Eve were created, they were perfect mentally, physically, and spiritually. Sin has caused tremendous losses in each of these areas. But God has promised that He is capable of restoring us if we give Him the opportunity. Look at a couple of passages. Acts 3.21 He must remain in heaven until the time comes for all things to be made new. We're talking about Jesus as God announced to His holy prophets who lived long ago. And Revelation 21, 1-5, you know, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's... Sorry, we lost that for a second. My computer is running away from me here. back to where we need to be. Sorry. And I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I will make all things new. He also said to me, Write this because these words are true and can be trusted. It's pretty, pretty definitive, right? God made it very clear that a new heaven and a new earth are coming. While he was on this earth, Jesus did everything possible to uplift us spiritually, mentally, and physically. But remember, there was no reason for him to come the first time if he does not plan to come back. So what should we do to prepare ourselves for the second coming? Well, our Bible study guide suggests three basic ideas. First, like the muscles of the body, the brain grows stronger with use. If we fill our minds with what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, see Philippians 4, 8, then our mental capacity will grow. Two, good health habits such as exercise and proper diet are, all, are ways that we can improve our mental capacity as well as our physical endurance in lives. Exercise lowers stress and blood pressure, improves mood, and is probably more effective at anti-aging than anything available in the drugstore or online. Three, 
the true steward of God will develop good habits to invigorate the soul. And just I'll just read a few verses there, Psalms 86, 4 and 5. Make your servant glad, O Lord, because my prayers go up to you. You are good to us and forgiving, full of constant love for all who pray to you. And then in... Psalm 62, verse 5, I depend on God alone. I put my hope in Him. And through John 3, I was so happy when some fellow Christians arrived and told me how faithful you are to the truth, just as you always live in the truth. Thus, we can be preserved of blameless when Jesus comes back. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. So think about the rituals or the habits, we can call them, that you go through every day. Are they good? Are they promoting, promoting physical, mental, and spiritual health? Would it be better if you could change some of those habits? What choices could you make that would improve your health in each of those areas? Well, let's talk about a few of them. One very important habit is self-discipline. That is by no means a natural trait, meaning natural for human beings. However, it is one of the most important characteristics a steward can have. Remember Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Spirit produces what? Love, Love. joy, peace, patience, peace. kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Do those things happen naturally for human beings? No. 2 Timothy 1, 7 puts it this way. But the Spirit that God has given us for the spirit that God has given us does not make us timid. Instead, His Spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. Okay, power, love, and self-control. Wow. So these are just a couple of the voices, verse, verses that suggest that we need to develop self-control, self-discipline. God challenges us to have balanced, sound minds that hold fast to God's principles in our lives. Think of some biblical examples. Daniel, we've mentioned him earlier, but now let's talk about that a little bit more. Daniel refused to change his worship habits even with the threat of being thrown into the lion's den, and God protected him. Was that a foolish thing to do? I mean, what if he had just left the windows closed? Wouldn't his prayers have been heard just as well? Do you think Daniel knew that he was being watched? Oh yeah, I think so. When we come to the end of our world, in the last days, are we going to be, should we be just practicing our religion openly for everybody to observe, or is it better for us to be a little cautious? Well, even Jesus says, go in your closet. Mm -hmm. Can't forget that one. Yeah. Well, Samson lived a self-indulgent life and ended up having his eyes gouged out and doing the job of an animal. Judges 16. Joseph refused to be seduced by Potiphar's wife, Genesis 39. By contrast, Solomon ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines and ended up worshiping some of their pagan gods, 1 Kings 11, 4 and 5, 4 and 5. Paul was very clear in his understanding of the importance of self-discipline. I think, who's got that one? I do. Okay. 1 Corinthians 9, 23, 27. All this I do for the gospel's sake, in order to share it in its blessings. Surely you know that many runners take part in a race, but only one of them wins the prize. Run then in, s in such a way as to win the prize. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with the wreath that will not last, but we do it for the one that will last forever. That is why I run straight for the finish line. That is why I am like a boxer 
who does not waste his punches. I harden my body with blows and bring it under complete control to keep myself from being disqualified after having called others to the con to the contest. Wow. Okay, Jim, I think you have the next one there. The world is given to its self-indulgence. Errors and fables abound. Satan's snares for destroying souls are multiplied. All who would per Perfect holiness in the fear of the God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. The appetites and passions must be held in subjection to the higher powers of the mind. This self-discipline is essential to that mental strength and spiritual insight which will, be, which will enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truths of God's Word. For this reason, Temperance finds its place in the work of the preparation for Christ's second coming. So what is he saying there, to put it very practically? Well, educate yourself so that you have, can exercise self-control. Mm -hmm. And what will that do for you? Well, it make you ready for Christ's coming. Is it? Okay. Uh, I mean, how does that prepare us? If we exercise self-control, we eat a healthy diet, our thinking is clear. Or right. back to the last one of the uh, fruit of the, one of the fruit of the spirit is mm -hmm. self control. Yeah, and uh, well. but there's self control and there's self control mm -hmm. because the Pharisees had a lot of self control as well. Yeah, and that doesn't mean it was good self control. Yeah, right. So self control directed to self for my salvation, even the health reform can be counterproductive if it is directed towards self. So we really need to give that some thought. Is the self-control based on love or is it based on selfish, selfish motivations? Yeah. Many people do not realize this, but the really strict Pharisees fasted two days a week. That's self-control. <laughs> yeah, that's self-control. We hope they were honest in there. Well, and some of them, some of them did crazy things. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a group called the Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees. Mm -hmm. There were a group of Pharisees, a small group of Pharisees, who thought that uh, reading the Old Testament, that it was, it was wrong for a man to look on another man's wife, no matter to see her even in the street. So they wore a veil, so they could literally not see where they were going. And they would run into things and bruise themselves, literally because they're walking down the street not knowing where they're going. And they, they regarded these bruises as, as signs of real sainthood. Now, would, that, would you call that self-discipline? Sounds it crazy. Is, it is self-discipline, but it's directed towards self. So that's yeah. the whole problem. Craziness, right? Yeah. <laughs> Christians who are faithful to God must practice and train to be self-disciplined. It is impossible to be really good in, at, at any time you do without a lot of practice. In anyth at anything you do without a lot of practice. Athletes know this. Musicians know this. Christians should know this as well. There are some outstanding characters mentioned in the Bible. Think of Enoch. What does the Bible say about Enoch? He walked with God. He walked with God. How did he do that? He was of one mind and one spirit with him. So you, you remember the story of the little boy and they were asked him what, it, what, what, what was it that Enoch did? Well, he said, Enoch used to walk with God and one day God said, you know, we're closer to my house than you are to your house, so why don't we go to my house tonight? You know, there, there's some truth to that. I thought that was a great story. And what about Noah? I mean, think of the environment in which he lived, the kind of people that were surrounding him and so forth. Just... Probably similar to what it was say in Matthew, as yeah. it was in the days of Noah, so shall it yeah. be in the time to come into the Son of Man. Well, look at these verses about Noah, Genesis 5, 24. He spent his life in fellowship with God, and then he disappeared. I mean, this is Enoch, I'm sorry. Then he disappeared because God took him away. And then Genesis 6, 9, this is Noah. This is the story of Noah. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had no faults and was the only good man of his time. He lived in fellowship with his God. 
What is implied by that? Wow. Ellen White had some very interesting words to say about Daniel and his friends. If we want to know what it means to walk with God. Um, let me that's just... You. That's me. Talking about Daniel, remember this is what we're talking about. They, Daniel and his friends, realized that in order to, in order to understand... It, or, in order to stand as representatives of true religion amid the false religions of heathenism, they must have clearness of intellect and must perfect a Christian character. And God himself was their teacher. Is that still possible today? Yes. God himself was their teacher. Constantly praying, conscientiously studying, keeping in touch with the unseen, they walked with God as did Enoch. Does that give us a better idea of what it means to walk with God? Prophets and Kings 480, first, uh, first, first paragraph. So what, what did, I mean, Daniel and his friends were going to the university, the University of Babylon, we could call it, trying to learn a new culture, a new language, all the details of court and how to, how to behave and so forth in that kind of environment. So in that setting, how do they walk with God? Humbly. Humbly, okay. We'll get to Micah. Yeah. Do you think sometime, someone in 2018 could live, walk with God as they did? Mm -hmm. could, could one of us do that? Is there any way to protect ourselves from the evils of our world? We go through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have, we have to de use our own self-defense, probably limit our options but uh well carrie has an interesting quote from our bible study guide just snippets from various places in the bible what, what does that say being a faithful steward entails an all-encompassing life that begins with being in agreement with god and that comes from amos 3 3 we must walk in christ that's from Colossians 2, 6. Walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4. Walk in love, Ephesians 5, 2. Walk in wisdom, Colossians 4, 5. Walk in truth, Psalms 86, 11. Walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. Walk in integrity, Proverbs 19, 1. Walk in his law, Exodus 16, 4. Walk in good works, Ephesians 2.10, and walk the straight path, Proverbs 4.26. Does that seem a little bit like an impossible task? A lot of different things to do. But those are probably all describing various aspects of the same thing. Yeah. It's what happens when we love. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. One of the characteristics that Jesus emphasized was humility. But it is a difficult trait for proud human beings to develop. Um, what, is, what does Jesus say about, what did Jesus say about that? Remember Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to 31? Take my yoke and put it on you and, you and learn it from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest. For, your, for the yoke I, will, I give you, I will give you is easy and the load I will put on you is light. So after reading Carrie's list there, it seemed like the yoke that Christ puts on us is pretty heavy. All those things you've got to do. But Jesus himself said, the yoke is light. What did he mean by that? Micah 6 verse 8 tells us, mm -hmm. no, it's not a heavy load. No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Very good. To live in humble fellowship with our God. Would, would people notice that we live lives like that? Yeah. I'm wondering about this translation of good news because really it's not humility in the, f in the presence of God. It's humility with one another. Yeah? You want it. What other version would you like to read from? Uh, most any other. <laughs> Most any other? Well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's choose one. Um, mm -hmm. 
Let's see. You want to try the English Standard Version? Well, let's 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 try the message. Oh, well, that, that's a paraphrase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. I can give you just about any one you want. Should we try the New Revised Standard Version? Yeah. Sounds good. See if it'll pop over there. Well, now we, okay. Hold on here while I get to the verse we're talking about. Micah six, six to eight. Um, And I don't know why it's not going where I want it to, but here, let's do this. New American Standard says, and to walk humbly with your God, or circumspectly with your God. Okay. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? This is verse 6. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall he give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Is that better? Maybe not, uh, because the word here is equally with your God. If you really go in the original language and, and from the Greek, or from, from the Hebrew in this Hebrew. case, yeah, with or with humility as does God. Mm -hmm. It's not an interesting thought though because we should be humble with one another as much as God is humble with us. Think about it. He sent us the Son who came as a babe to this mm -hmm. world. What humility. And, I mean, if he, if he agrees to come down and walk with us, how humiliating is that? He's coming down to our level. It's amazing. Yeah. And then he could call every, the disciples friends instead of slaves to yeah. slim. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, look at a couple of other verses on this general topic. Titus 2, 7. In all things, you yourself must be an example of good behavior. Be sincere and serious in your teaching. Psalm 119, 72, the law that you gave means more to me than all the money in the world. Wow. Matthew 5, 8, happy are the pure in heart, they will see God. That's pretty clear. These are just a few of the characteristics that we should be developing. Self-control, obedience to God's law, and purity of heart. What does purity of heart mean? An undivided heart. Okay. So you're not part of it. It doesn't talk about the four chambers that pump blood. Right. No. No, what does it mean? It talks about thinking, doesn't it? Yeah. Talks about our mind. Your inner being. Yeah. It talks about our will. Mm hmm Well, how can we become better users of time? Do we understand it? I mean I it just you know, I deal with a lot of people who are, have got various kinds of problems. I work in a clinic where there's a lot of, of uh, low income or people who are disabled, that kind of stuff. And my schedule is just chock-a-buck full. From early morning to late at night, I work as fast as I can. And then I talk to these people all day long. Well, what do you do? Well, I do a lot of sitting. I watch TV all day. I must drive... It would drive me insane. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, I guess that's all they have to do. I, I keep thinking, you know, isn't there some way I can give them <laughs> something to do for, <laughs> that I, for me? Anyway, do we realize how much time we might be wasting when we could be preparing for the kingdom of, to come? Look at Psalms 119, 9 to 11. How can young people keep their lives pure? By obeying your commands. With all my heart, I try to serve you. Keep me from disobeying your commandments. I keep your law in my heart so that I will not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your ways. So that's a pretty clear expression of what uh, we should do. David very clearly recognized that to keep our lives pure, we need to obey God's laws and His commands. So what practical steps can we take to incorporate more spiritual habits into our lives? 
Well, once again, we think about Matthew 6, 33. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. How does God provide us with all these other things? What are the only other things we need? Yeah. The message that comes from Jesus, the truth that leads us to that beautiful love of his. Mm -hmm. And will set you free. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, is, is it wrong for us to be so busy? You know, so many people are busy, busy. Mm -hmm. That means that they're just busy for the sake of being busy. They'll do puzzles all day long. They'll do video games all day long. That's being busy. But, you know, you give them something to read about the Lord or about even a simple philosophy sometimes, and they can't even get through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their attention span is blown by all these games that they play and programs yeah. they watch on TV and all that. If you want to talk about somebody who must have been incredibly busy, it was Jesus. I mean, think about the, the times in which he lived. There were no hospitals, there was no clinics. I'm just thinking of one aspect of his life. And everybody from all the countries around knew, if you can get to Jesus, you can be healed. Yes, but even Jesus knew his limits. Yeah. And when the disciples told him, uh, there is another village over there, there are a lot of people are sick there, they need you. Well, now it's time to go home and go to bed. <laughs> yeah. So what things could we adjust in our lives to give us a closer walk with God? How can we develop better habits, habits that will bring us closer to the kingdom of God? How can we know for sure which practices are the most effective ways to walk with God? Well, practice makes perfect, we say. We also need to practice what we preach. There's a very, very interesting story here. I think, Dennis, is this yours? Yeah. A high school track and field uh, coach once interviewed a prospective athlete who boasted that she could high jump five feet six inches, which is quite impressive. Her performance, however, was quite different. After the first two track meets or competitions, she was ready to quit because she had not been able to jump the ent entering height, which was only three feet six inches, two feet lower than her boast of uh, five feet three, um, three feet six inches, two feet lower than her boast of five feet six inches. Nevertheless, she persisted, returning to jumping fundamentals. She practiced each component of jumping repeatedly. She mastered her approaches, approach steps, perfected her arc, and transformed the jumping functions into intuitive habit. She established the, high, the school high, high jump record that year and placed third at state championships. The following year she established the district championship rec meet record five feet three inches and was runner-up at state championships. Following graduation, graduation she was recruited to top universities. This was from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Guide 159. Okay. So what do we learn from that story? Perseverance. Yeah. So if you really, really... Now, not everybody can do everything. But if you pick something that you think you're good at, that, you're, that you enjoy doing, and you really, really focus on that, and you determine to do it the best you possibly can, and you, we, we discussed earlier the fact that an expert in some areas, some people say you can be an expert in any area if you spend 10,000 hours on that. So, here's a lady, I don't know how much time she spent, but... Uh, 10,000 hours is a long time. 10,000 hours is a long time. Four years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have, you, day. have you ever set a goal for yourself like this young woman did? If you keep working on it, can you make progress? Many of us would not be able to jump five foot six inches. Probably none of us could jump that high. But each of us can develop a close walk with God if we are determined to do so. Unfortunately, many of the uses of the word habit are connected to bad things like obsessions, addictions, etc. I had um, a very sad case 
today that came into me at the clinic, a young woman with four children that were totally dependent upon her, um, involved in several different marriage arrangements at different times, and now she's totally addicted to a number of different substances. And, and she has one baby that's like six months old. And, and how do you help someone like that that's just, you know, you, you feel like pulling your hair out? I mean, you don't know whether you seem to say, okay, I'm going to refuse to give you any of your medicines that you need, go home and sweat it out. And, you know, she, she just, she would sit there and tell us, you know, things get so bad, I feel like I could shoot somebody. Well, you know, <laughs> what do you say to that, you know? So, obsessions and addictions can be very evil. But habits do not need to be bad. Forming good habits is one of the requirements that we need to develop. So how do we decide, okay, here's a good habit, I'm going to develop it? I think we have to be careful not to put too much emphasis on what we do mm -hmm. in terms of habits. What about the habit of seeking mm -hmm. the Word of God? Because it's eventually when we understand what it's all about that our actions will follow through. Mm -hmm. So the habit of seeking God by trying to really understand what He tells us in His Word, that we might become more like Him, that will guide us in all that we do. So perhaps the emphasis is on the wrong thing. It's on the doing instead of the seeking the truth, okay. the Word of God. Well, and I don't think any of us would argue very long, any of us here anyway, for sure, would argue against the idea that seeking the Lord would be a good thing to do. And the Bible read superficially can, I remember when I was in the eighth grade, I, I needed to read the Bible through for one of my projects. It was boring. I thought, man, but now, I re every time I get a chance, I read the Bible, and I find it fascinating. I find one story adds to my understanding of another story. And what's the difference? The difference is now I begin to understand it, and I, I, see, I, I see new things in everything I study. So, yes, seeking. Very good. Well, do we start our days with God, thus placing Him as top priority in our lives? We turn now what I do. I just give you my example. I don't not putting myself up as, as any kind of an example, but the first thing I do in the morning, get up, I get dressed, ready to go out, and I run for an hour. And while I'm running, and, and I, I enjoy running, but that's not the real reason I, I go out and run. The real reason I go out and run is because I'm listening to Bible, Spirit of Prophecy, other you know, inspirational books and so forth, and, and that's, that's what gets my mind going in the morning. So, I would recommend that. Try that, some of you out there. Do we return a faithful tithe, thus recognizing that God owes everything, or owns everything that we have in our possession? What might we expect as a result of making God first in our lives? We might find that Satan works even harder to trip us up. Is that something we need to worry about? Well, one of the few commandments in the Bible involving time is the fourth commandment. Clearly, God said that we are to spend six days doing our work and one day resting as our Sabbath. There were also special times for celebrating, such as weddings and births. Work, family, rest. Let's see, I guess actually this should be... Is this yours, Gary? Uh, no, no Gary. Gary, I'm sorry. Work, family, rest, and worship seems to be the dominant themes of the fourth commandment. What seems missing overtly, at least, is explicit instructions regarding leisure and entertainment. Mm. Wow. Contemporary culture, through technology, technological advancements that have lessened our workload, has filled the emptiness with entertainment much of which is pointless at best and destructive at worst. But it could be argued that the fourth commandment provides sacred principles that we can apply to our use of leisure time and that we can use 
to govern our recreational activities. Okay. So Ellen White's giving us some very clear instructions there. Was God suggesting that we do not need time for leisure and entertainment? In light of the times in which we live, we should, uh, should leisure and entertainment form a major part of our schedule? I don't think so. Christian stewards will also be cautious in their consumption of beverages, Proverbs 20, 20 and 23. Avoiding sexual immorality, Leviticus 18 and 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Preventing various other diseases, for example, in Leviticus 14, and following God's advice about various healthful habits. And I guess, Jim, do you have the last one there? Paul admired athletic discipline and used running to illustrate spiritual principles related to self-control. God's promise to ancient Israel is equally meaningful for modern Israel. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Another way you could say which, which the Egyptians suffered rather than yeah. blaming a God for bringing the, the uh, illness or the disease mm -hmm. on the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Well, in our lesson so far, we've talked about responsible stewardship in the areas of spiritual, physical, mental, and financial and emotional health, health and well-being. Have our lives improved as a result of what we have learned? How can we develop habits which we know are essential for Christian stewards? Does physical activity and exercise which improves physical health also contribute to our spiritual growth? Yes, it does. It does by improving the circulation in our brains so that we can think more clearly. Does God intend for us to get buried in a hectic schedule? Do we live balanced lifestyles? What would happen for, to our lives if we made God first in everything we do and think? Let me put that question to you out there. What would happen to your life if you made God first in everything you do? Think about it. We, we live in a world where it's so easy to get caught up with in a million things that, and many of them are good, not everything's bad, but we have one thing, Paul said, one thing I focus on, getting ready for the second coming. Kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to learn more about you. Help us to realize how important that is and to make it first priority in our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.